Good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Nice late start today. Um, we're going to be talking about controlling access to OpenStack in the enterprise. Byline, this is not public cloud. Um, so let's get cracking. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, finished. Okay. So who am I? Um, my name is Sean O'Mara. I'm a senior systems architect with Morantis. Um, I'm also the architecture consulting practice lead for EMEA, Asia, PAC, and Russia. Um, so all the Morantis architects work in my team within this region. Uh, I've been in the IT industry for over 20 years, primarily focused on enterprise um, and various types of enterprise solutions. Uh, I've been, my first OpenStack public cloud was built on Essex. Um, so I've been in the OpenStack community for a while. I've dealt with the pain. Um, a lot of those clouds have been built in enterprise. So this is some of my learning, some of the learning from Morantis. Um, we're going to be discussing this today, and I'm going to be asking for a lot of feedback from you guys at the end of the session um, and going on into the future around these particular topics. So we'll discuss typical requirements seen in the enterprise. We'll talk about how OpenStack does access control today. Where's it falling short? What is being done and what can we do as a community and as operators? Uh, I'm assuming most people in the room here are operators or some are involved in the OpenStack. And then we'll talk about some RBAC solutions that are available. So just setting the scene, I'm talking about enterprise. I'm not talking about public cloud. I'm talking about dealing with things like private clouds, hosted clouds, the typical snowflake clouds that we're all building. Um, I'm not talking about any particular distro either of OpenStack. Public clouds are different. They have different immediate needs. The way that they're legislated is different. The rules around public clouds are very different. We're talking about integration in OpenStack with that stuff from Big Vendor X. Okay? Every data center has somebody else's weird and wonderful auth system in place. We're colliding with the old world. We're colliding with a whole bunch of things that relate to governance, um, typical role hierarchies, uh, and I'll talk more about that in a second. The one point I'd like to make is a lot of the asks that we see from enterprises don't always make sense, but they need to be met anyway. It's not a case of that doesn't make sense, we won't deal with it. Even if it doesn't make sense, sometimes we've got to deal with it, especially when it comes to authentication and auditors. Okay. So what are the enterprise requirements that we're dealing with these days? Enterprises want different backends. There are typically three or four different type of authentication backends that we're seeing. It's caused by different org structures. It's caused by different trust levels. And go to any enterprise today and you're going to find everything from Microsoft Active Directory to Novell, you, you, the whole gamut, something from IBM, etc. We need to integrate to existing systems. A lot of these auth systems are in place. The rules are in place around them. The companies have spent many years and many man hours setting these things up. We need to comply. So those of you who work in big organizations with big IT departments, you'll understand this. And then along come the auditors. Single sign-on. Single sign-on is a critical component within a lot of organizations. We're trying to cut down sprawl. We're trying to cut down on the number of usernames, password combinations, and access endpoints that users need to understand and deal with, both at an infrastructure level and an application level. Audit requirements, show of hands, who's been through an IT general controls governance audit? I can't believe it's so few people in this room. Um, an IT general controls governance audit is something that anybody who's worked in the financial services industry, anyone who's worked in a legislated industry will understand. And we'll talk a bit more about separation of duties in a second. And then governance. Governance is something that we often ignore as techies because we think we know better. I've been there. I've fallen into that trap. Governance comes in many forms. It can be corporate governance and rules that we have to apply, or it can be legislation. Um, I live in Germany now. The German IT governance rules from the government are intense. I see some smiling faces, but they're intense. And I don't speak German, so I can't even read them. OK, so auth backends. One of the big things about auth backends in, in the enterprise is we tend to have a lot of multi-tiered auth backends. 
we have different trust zones that we have to deal with. Um, a typical example is you'll have an internal Active Directory, you'll have a LDAP solution for customers, and then you'll have third-party sign-in from vendors. All of those have different trust levels and different ways of getting, gaining access to them within the enterprise. They have different rules, different roles. So we've got to handle things like role mapping. Those are the enterprise requirements, and these are the things that we as OpenStack and the OpenStack community need to start learning to deal with. Um, I mean, I've got some examples up there. We're talking about LDAP solutions. We've got Open LDAP. We've got Vendor LDAP, um, IBM, various others. Active Directory uses Kerberos as an auth mechanism, which doesn't give us any of that extra information, so we've got to get role information elsewhere. And then one of the ones that's starting to take a lot of light these days is federated solutions. Um, Shibboleth IDP, uh, SAML assertions, things like that that we have to start dealing with in the community, and we need to be able to deal with those things well. Now, a lot of the focus of what I'm talking to about today will be on role-based access controls. Um, we'll discuss that in a bit more depth and how OpenStack's handling that. But what's important to understand about the authentication mechanisms being used is depending on where the data is coming from, we may have different levels of data available to us to achieve those goals. A lot of our auth backends are also historical. Um, you know, they've been around since year dot. They've got user directories of hundreds of users who nobody really knows what they're for, and a lot of them are very slow. Uh, we're talking about OpenStack and how fast the APIs need to run. We've got to take that into account. So we're talking caching and cache handling of tokens and things like that. User separation, I've, I've talked about, and we'll talk more about that shortly, but it's about trusted users um, and role management. So. Other enterprise requirements. Granular access control in the enterprise is critical. We're seeing a lot of customers talking to us about separating admins, admin roles, and reducing admin access. A lot of customers are saying, great, we want administrators to be able to create a tenant in OpenStack, but never get into that tenant. We want admins who can work at the API layer, but no access to the operating systems. Um, you know, a lot of those separations of duties are required within the, within the enterprise. It is fairly nonsensical to us who are used to as, you know, having root on a Linux box and able to do whatever we please. We can't do that anymore. It comes back to the audit requirements around general controls and the separation of duties. So anyone who's done any work in the finance industry, as I said earlier, general controls auditing, separation of duties, that extends not just into the administration of OpenStack, but the consumption of OpenStack. And I'm focusing on OpenStack, but obviously this goes into the consumption of workload and workload authentication. And the last one which I've got there is obviously corporate standards. You, this extends right from financial controls down to our technical controls. Delegation of management is something which we want. Um, it doesn't exist today in any meaningful form. We need a mechanism that I can delegate portions of control to my environment to alternative users, but with very specific rights to create users but maybe not do anything, which means I'm starting to create very complex access hierarchies. <clears throat> the other thing that's required is workflow. All authentication. All access control to the OpenStack community we, and OpenStack resources, we need some sort of authorization to that. And I'm not talking about authorization here in the AAA sense. I'm talking about approval. If I want to increase my quota, someone needs to approve that increase. How are we handling that and how do I access the control access to that? I'm not pretending I have answers to all of this, but I'm saying these are the requirements. Okay. Just a quick refresher, AAA, what is AAA? Authentication, authorization, and accounting. We need to handle each of these things within our environments. So it's the who are you, what can you do, and what did you do. Um, I hope you like my little split log there. Um, we're going to focus the rest of the discussion this morning mostly around authorization and what OpenStack is handling in authorization today um, and how we can move forward with that. Okay. So RBAC, role-based access control. At some point in our lives, we've all dealt with it. Um, those of you who have been around as long as I have has probably dealt with you know, various group-level systems in Active Directory or LDAP 
or OUs. Those are all role assignments. So how's it done today? Within OpenStack today, every single project API does its own policy checking. The policy checking is done through the Oslo policy enforcer class, and I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit further. That policy checking is based on a flat file that is stored on the API service on each instance of the API. So if you've got 10 Nova APIs running, you have 10 policy.json files. Currently, there is no single store for that. It's all, current, it's all currently available only as policy files. The policy file is essentially like a set of firewall rules that the user is compared to a rule and it allows you to do certain things. The default policy set today has only got three users in it, or four users, all who are basically some form of admin. It's very difficult to change this. It's not impossible, but it's complex, and it can get very messy, and you have to have distribution systems to get that policy everywhere. Keystone currently handles user CRUD, role and project assignment, role creation, all sits within Keystone, and the back ends are typically LDAP for authentication, or SQL, or now federation through some sort of SAML2 assertion. Okay. Assignment back ends currently within OpenStack are, comes out of the SQL database. Whatever SQL database you're using in the back end, that's where your assignments are for Keystone. The challenge with that is it's very easy to create extra roles within Keystone. It's a lot harder to assign specific rights to those roles and to get the hierarchy correct, those roles actually are signed correctly. So the enforcer class within the Oslo policy is the class that handles both the loading of the rules, the checking of the rules, and agreeing to pass and fail of the rules within OpenStack. The enforcer class is slowly being worked on. There are a number of new enhancements coming within Oslo policy. Um, those of you who are interested in the code base, it's all available. There's a lot going on. I'll talk about a few of the blueprints in a second. Um, but it's a very simple class. Within that class, there's an enforce. Every single time you make an API call with an OpenStack, enforce is called. Every single call you make, enforce is called. The rule sets are loaded every time you make a call, although now they're cached as well, so not strictly true. But if there's a change to the policy file, it's reloaded. That obviously is, a, and if you start thinking about doing this, it's adding an extra potential cycle delay in an API call. So if you've got a very busy cloud, you have to realize that every call is an extra delay coming along. So when you try and change that system out for something else, you have to be very aware of the performance. So policy.json, for those of you who haven't seen a policy.json file yet, the, let's see if this works. That is what a policy.json file looks like. It's a set of rules that denote to an API call that then denote to a role or a user or, there are a number of special checks available in policy.json. Newish, newish one is an HTTP call. You can actually add a rule that you can pass certain information across using an HTTP call, get an answer back. Now, I spoke earlier about speed. Can you imagine 1,000 API calls that have to make 1,000 HTTP calls a second to some arbitrary HTTP server that's got to process something? You're now starting to add, not milliseconds, but seconds into your call cycle. I mean, just think about the HTTP setup, never mind everything else that goes along with that. So the whole policy of JSON mechanism, it was great when it was first put in place. The teams are doing a lot of work to try and make it better, but we need a lot more user input, and a lot more operations input to the community to explain what's required from enterprise, from operators. Okay. A couple of new features that have come around. There is the capability now to load policy files from an API. Um, Keystone has an API backend for policy. Nobody's using it. None of the projects are actually using it at the moment. But the ability is there. And the ability is there that you can now use the authorized instead of enforced class 
to make those calls. Okay. So what's RBAC currently lacking within OpenStack? There are no native auditing capabilities. Yes, we've got the logs, but those don't really say whether things were applied or not. It's just a fall-through mechanism. The only time you get a log is if there's a failure. You don't get positive logging currently. And for those of you who have to deal with general controls auditing, positive logging is seriously required. It's a critical component. It's one of those things that we have to be able to prove. We have to be able to go back six months, a year sometimes, and show, yes, that person accessed that resource at that time. And we have to prove that. And we have to have those logs in a way that we can place reliance on them. There is no method right now built in that allows us to programmatically modify the rules for RBAC. Okay? Those rules are currently, as I said, just this flat file model. They all are created outside of the creation of the API call currently, and I'll come to what's happening in the future in a second. But <laughs> what it means is I can't do, for example, time-based access controls. I can't say an admin can do you know, between eight and five, he can do something, but not between five and seven. Can't do that because there's no pro programmatic way to change it. Yes, there are external systems, before someone argues with me, but there are external ways of doing it, but they all have different pitfalls and problems. Lack of synchronization. I spoke earlier about the APIs. If I'm running a massively scaled cloud and I want to scale my APIs, so if I want to put 20 Nova API instances out there to help me scale, Every time I create that instance, I need to make sure that that policy file is copied identically across each one of them. So that's a big challenge. Because there's no centralized store, I'm also in a situation from a control perspective that if I get it wrong on one, if I leave the default policy on one of those APIs and somebody hits that API and they get to do something, A, I won't know about it because I haven't logged it. B, they've got different access rights all because of an admin mistake, a failure of automation. It happens. Stuff doesn't copy correctly. Okay. It has a terrible format. I mean, uh, I'll go back to this, but working out what's actually happening in policy.json is painful. It's truly painful. I've written some complex policy.json files. They, making sure that the rules actually apply in the order you think they're applying it requires so much testing and so much review that you're never quite sure because there's always going to be that weird thing that somebody tries to do that you didn't think about and, oh, wow, they're allowed to do that and they're not supposed to. So, multiple locations, I've mentioned, creates ambiguity. It makes us not be able to place reliance on these things. And I, I keep using this word, place reliance. General control audit is about placing reliance on data and systems. We have to place reliance. And then finally, it creates massive separation of duties issues. For me to create a new user who has control over just a small portion means I have to go and review everything else within the stack. The other thing is an overtly long policy file. It takes longer to load, uses more memory, takes longer to process. It just the complexity grows and grows. So what's happening in the community today? So the Oslo team are doing a lot of work, as long as the Keystone team, to programmatically create defaults and the default rule sets for the JSON. The way this is going to be handled, it's going to be within, and this is, I don't want to go into too much dev here, but basically within the code, within each API call, there will be a default JSON or policy call which can be read out and create the policy file automatically. The advantage of that is you know you're always going to have the same defaults. It's not somebody's bad copy and paste. It's not a fiddle. So every time you spin up a new copy of the API, you get a new copy of the policy file, which you can modify, but it makes it a lot simpler to manage. It, a big part of this is the policy JSON files today. If I go into GitHub, and I pull the policy JSON file for Nova and from Trunk, and if I pull it from somebody else, I have no guarantee that they're going to be the same thing because people modify them all the time. The other big change, and this is the one which I really like, is instead of using the current language for assertion, we're going to start using YAML 
Well, that means hierarchy. We can use YAML hierarchies to define policy. We're going to be able to put comments in. You can put comments kind of in the policy files today, but more often than not, they break the policy assertion. So we're going to be able to put comments in. We're going to be able to explain what we're trying to achieve. All of this is great. It's a way forward. But it still doesn't solve the basic problem that the stuff is in files on the APIs, and I'm not linking it back to my organizational data coming out of my directory structures. So what are we trying to achieve? Um, this has been going on for almost a year now. We've been doing a lot of work into this. We spoke about this in Austin. We have a working demo. We're looking at creating a pluggable enforcer class for, uh, for Ozoda policy. Currently, they are not accepting a pluggable enforcer class. There are a few, few blueprints out there for it. What that means is that I'll be able to come along, pull out the current enforcer class, plug in my own enforcer model, and then be able to do those lookups and those ver the RBAC verification against another backend. Typically in enterprise, I'm going to do that against LDAP or some sort of LDAP-based system, tree system. If you have a massive SQL database that does your enterprise role behind, great, we can use that. But this is where, as a community, we need people to start talking about what's required from an enterprise perspective, openly on the dev channels, in the community channels, in the community user group talks, so that the developers can start to understand the importance of this. I think they understand the importance, but that we need, as a community, to be pushing against it. We need to be able to centralize the assignments and policy backends. The current situation where we're creating roles in one place that have no relation to policies assigned in another place, we need to fix that. We need to pull those closer together. What we need to be aware of when doing this, and I've mentioned before, is we need to be aware of performance. This mechanism needs to be fast. It cannot be a delayed, slow mechanism. And the loading of rules, we need to make a decision about whether they're real-time rules or cached, and that comes back to affecting performance. So where are we? There is a blueprint, make and force call pluggable, that was logged six or seven months ago now. Um, please go in and have a look and comment on that blueprint. The idea is that we're going to create a pluggable enforcer class, which means, just like a lot of the other OpenSec projects, we've essentially created a driver. This takes away a lot of the argument, takes away a lot of the challenges. Yes, we'll still have the OpenStack reference mechanism with this policy.json, but let's move forward. Let's allow other people to move forward. Um, the driver for Oslo policy is related to the make and force call. Um, the code's there, it's available. Um, there are options that we've done which will allow us to do this, but we need the first one to be accepted to get the second one working. For those of you interested, all the Oslo policy blueprints are also there. Go and have a look at them. Um, get an idea of where they are, what the status is, and comment, please. Sound like I'm selling something. Um, OK, so alternative approaches. We've run into this challenge at a number of customers. We've run into this challenge in a number of scenarios. So we have started working on different models to be able to handle this at speed. So a number of people within Marantis have been working on this. What are the goals? We want to centralize the assignment backend and policy backend. Leverage, so in this case we work with Fortress, but it could be another LDAP. We leverage Fortress to introduce new features for the OpenStack RBAC, to be able to do all this OU-based, role-based component. Delegation of permissions, hierarchical RBAC, which is a critical component. Um, native support for multi-site. Here's another classic one. Multi-site replication has been solved for LDAP and for most authentication providers. Why do we need to solve that for Keystone? Someone's done it already. We don't need to solve that problem. Let's just consume what has been done already. We've also leveraged Midpoint to provide a single point of management for RBAC and RBAC controls and authentication controls, user CRUD, all of that within the environment. So how does this tie together? The Oslo policy 
call will happen to Fortress. We have a driver that talks to Fortress. Fortress has a very good RBAC interface already. It has a solution available. There are other ways to do this, but this is one we've been experimenting with. It does the lookup against Fortress every single time the call is made. So obviously I was talking about delays. There is a minuscule delay, but because of the speed of Fortress and because of the way they handle it, that delay is fairly negligible. Um, in small scale testing, we haven't seen any issues. You know, in the interest of full disclosure, we haven't done large scale testing on this. So you know, we have to see how that works. The keystone, the assignment backend, could come from midpoint, but will still be stored potentially in the SQL. The longer term goal here is that all will come from Fortress. So everything will come from that LDAP assignments backend. Now, this changes a little bit if we want to start using Federation. If we start using SAML assertions from Federation, where we do that assignment and that role access is also has to change. It has to come from whatever is behind the IDP. So that information has to be provided from somewhere. Keystone still needs to be aware of it because it's part of the call, but it can be created on the fly. So it doesn't need to be permanently stored within Keystone, especially if all the policy information is coming from somewhere else. Okay. So how do we get there? We've got two assignment connectors that we're working on, two versions of the assignment connector. Um, there's assignment and user creation right now, which is working. Uh, it's fairly effective. It's a little complex to get work to set up. And once you throw SAML into the mix, it gets the fun of getting an IDP to work with an SP and all of that. And if you've dealt with that, it's a lot of fun. The OpenStack permissions API, which is being worked on, we need to influence that. We need to deal with the way that that's being moved forward at the moment. Essentially, what's happened within Keystone, they've created a, a way to store policy. We need to handle Fortress support for groups, projects, because currently OpenStack doesn't really recognize some of the, that information, like OUs. Um, potentially extend Fortress Commander to act as a UI. So, in summary, I, I've spoken about it during the session. How can you help us? You can help us by getting your stories out there, by talking in the community and telling us what you need. Let us know your business, your specific user case, your specific user stories, typical user story generation. We need to understand what it is you're trying to achieve in the community. We need to understand how you're trying to achieve it. We need people in the various regions around the world who understand the governance requirements, both from government and industry, to share that information in a way that's consumable to developers and engineers. And that's the input which we really need your help on. So, I don't know how much time I've got left. Oh, I've got through pretty quickly. Any questions? Absolute silence. Is everybody awake? <laughs> I'm not. So, any questions I can answer? It is in place and it does work, but it needs it needs help. <laughs> so um, we, we still have like bigger even underlying problems, like for example, the whole authorization thing isn't even working correctly. Right. If you're an admin Okay. So my point is that if you're an admin anywhere, uh, you're an admin everywhere. Yeah. Right? There is the Keystone the, the very famous Keystone bug open since twenty twelve. And all of this is great. But before you fix that bug, it actually doesn't okay, so do much, right? I, I can answer to that. I, I, didn't want, I didn't go into detail here on that. But So part of the work that they're doing with assigning the auto-creating the rules within Keystone, so within the API, so every time you create the API, you have that call, is to remove that particular call. I know the one you're referring to. It's the one that says, if admin, drop. Don't even run through the checks. Part of that is to remove that. Now, there is actually a bug log for it. There is work happening on it. Uh, it's been addressed in one of the blueprints. I, I, the top mate, I can tell you what it is. But part of that is to fix that. 
Um, in the code patch which we've done, we've actually removed that. We've taken it out uh, because it's the obvious way. <laughs> um, but it's a, very, it's a very valid question. And it is something that needs to be fixed. Um, and again, it, right now, because of this general assumption that an admin is God within an environment, um, that's kind of not really getting the focus it should get. What we need to be doing, and I come back, and I, I, I'll hop on this, and if you guys talk to me in the passageways, I'll keep doing this. But we need, as operators, to feed back our real-world requirements. It's great that we talk about it in the passages. It's great that we moan about these things. I mean, we all moan. I moan terribly, especially when I've got a nice glass of whiskey in my hand. It's, it's important that we get our messaging across, that we do it in the channels. Because I mean, some of these devs who are working on these projects are working on them either in their free time or are so snowed under, at the, um, under the volume of stuff they're trying to achieve on the cycles that they're only grabbing at the low-hanging fruit. And we need to help them prioritize. That's a really critical portion of what we need to do as operators. We need to help them prioritize. So any other questions? It's probably not correct for them to do this, but the one other place I know roles are read like that is Horizon to do a, an iteration. When you, when you log into Horizon, it wants to know what to show the user based on basically iterating through everything that's done. Yeah. Is that still possible when you're, I mean, that's a bulk tell me everything operation rather than a what is this? So, so our solution breaks Horizon right now. Okay. Um, but, I, okay, this is my personal opinion and someone's gonna throw something at me. I believe that if you're building an enterprise-grade cloud, you shouldn't be installing Horizon. <laughs> Why are you interacting through Horizon when you have APIs? I mean, if you're doing proper automation, you don't need a pretty console. But please don't shoot me. Horizon has its place, so I'm not, I'm not knocking Horizon team, but it has its place for admins only. Uh, yeah, okay. I, I, I grew up in the age of Linux, and you know, I, mean, I started with MS DOS, so I never really got used to GUIs. Anything else, Ben? I'm a VMware administrator. I really like Horizon. It reminds me of vSphere. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, just kidding. So what so, I love about that question, and I'm going to actually answer it quickly. What I love that about wasn't my it, question, but go ahead. Um, I've done a lot of VMware implementations. And everything you can do through that, you can do through the command line and the CLI and an API call. Um, in fact, just like Horizon, where Horizon exposes you know, 30 40% of it possible with the API, vSphere exposes 30 to 40% of what's actually possible with VMware. Well, I said I was a VMware administrator. I don't know this command line that you speak of. I'm sorry. Somebody shut him up because he will carry on like this for the next 20 minutes. <laughs> my, my question really was, as far as best practice goes, um, let's say I have an IT service catalog. Um, let's just pick a vendor like ServiceNow um, that's driving my provisioning of new users mm -hmm. uh, through the API. Would you suggest that, that ServiceNow drive that through Keystone um, and then let it be handled in Keystone. Once you make these changes to, to do you know, programmatically through the API to make those changes, or have it drive LDAP, and then have the authentication come through okay. through LDAP. So I'm going to give you a very opinionated answer on that question. Um, to me, Keystone's job is to provide tokens. That's a big part of what Keystone's job is. Keystone shouldn't be the user backend. Keystone uh, can. There are, and I said this earlier, there are a million things that handle user management far better. That problem has been solved. Use Federation, get, let Keystone do its job, which is token management, token author, authorization. That's what it does very, very well and very fast. Let it do that. Let the user creation happen and user ownership happen somewhere else. So if you're using ServiceNow, ServiceNow uses some kind of back end, use a SAML2 assertion. I mean, this, so for those of you in enterprise, this is where we're pushing. 
we're pushing most of our enterprises to start using SAML. Okay. So many things support SAML. Active Directory supports SAML. Yes, you've got to install the federation component, but it supports it. A Shibboleth IDP, it works. There are a lot of them out there. Um, yes, it's finicky to set up and secure, but once it's done, it's done. You don't have to do it again. So, yeah, that's my opinionated answer. To get the German rules set down to one sentence, it's a don't trust anyone. <laughs> so, yeah, I was thinking about: is, wouldn't it be possible to start with a plain JSON file that just allows nothing, and then go with some kind of Ansible or other orchestrator and enter the things you want to use for a specific role by an orchestrator? So, so that's essentially what they're trying to achieve with this idea of moving to the Ansible, uh, to the policy file being auto-created on first use. This is what they're trying to achieve. Because we do need defaults. I mean, I think the Nova, I don't know if someone's got a machine in front of them, they can quickly check. How many lines are in the Nova policy.json? It's a couple of hundred. To go and hand create that couple of hundred when you're just trying to do basics is challenging at best, impossible. I mean, it's just, it'll take you so long and it's such a mess to achieve. The main point that I'm trying to bring across is we need to move away from this file. We need to be able to place reliance on information. We need single points of information um, to comply with various governance requirements. I mean, right now, as I, as I mentioned earlier, this idea that we've got potentially, you know, if I've got five Nova APIs, I've potentially got five different JSON files. Um, I can't audit that. I can't prove if I have a breach that I was in the right. And that's what we need to be able to do. And that's part of centralizing and bringing all that, all that enforcement into one place. And that's, that's, if there's a message, that's what I need to get across. Anything else? Silence? People way down the back there. All right. I'm done then. Thank you very much. <laughs>